This is John Bush again, and this is lecture number three on the uh, Miocene Aquifer System in Moscow Pulmonary in Washington, Idaho. Uh, to, the photograph you see is one of the few outcrops in the area. Uh, just out of interest, it's the low, low flow. Uh, this is the only outcrop that I know of to where you can see the base of the low, low flow where it's sitting on top of looks like a, uh, a weathered soil rising in brown and the yellow part is part of the of the late tall sediments. But the talk today is not on individual basalt structures, it's on the origin of the uh, Miocene aquifer system. Uh, and particularly what I would say the origin in just the Moscow Pullman area, although we will uh, go to the west a little bit and talk about the, the whole story or summarize the whole story and then relate it to the Moscow, Moscow area. Some of the things that uh, we'll be pointing out is what was the area like before the 16 million year old volcanic event that sent basalt flows into the area? Uh, a little bit about the basic model. Now what I mean about the basic model, when I talk about the origin, it's not about the plate tectonics or how the mantle originated. It's about the distribution of the flows. What was the climate like? How far did the flows go? Uh, that kind of thing. So in other words, it's sort of like a paleogeographic settings of what it was like during that time and how the flows got into the Moscow Pullman area because most of the flows originate a long distance away. Uh, we need to go over some stratigraphic terms. And what I mean by stratigraphic terms is that all of the salt flows, sometimes groups of flows have names and we see if we can boil that down just to uh, a handful of names rather than dealing with all the names. Uh, we'll always be going back to the cross section. The cross sections, the more I look at them, the more they tell me. So that it's the cross section, even though where primary one is east west, it tells us the most about the area. We'll refer to the last part, we'll go over the major events, major volcanic events that influenced our aquifer system. And we'll end up with present day setting and a short summary. Uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, let's remember how, what's, where we are. Let's look over here on the edge of the Columbia River Plateau. We're just a little wee piece over here where my cursor is at the Moscow Pool Basin. Very unique in that it's so deep. We have over 2,700 feet of lava flows and sediments in our subsurface. But just remember how big the Columbia River Plateau is. Uh, covers all of southeastern Washington, large portions in, in Oregon, extends all the way out to the, uh, to the ocean. All these areas are underlain by uh, Miocene uh, basalts uh, and sediments. So we need a little picture of the large area so we're gonna start though, what was it like here in, in Moscow and Pullman before the volcanic flows entered the area? we we'll take a little picture. We're gonna get down here to Tucson, Arizona. Now this is a desert climate. So the, the, the vegetation is not, wasn't the same. In the Miocene in Moscow, uh, it was very wet. Lots of vegetation. Uh, I'm told by Bill Remmer, who was working on a classic site out of Clark, east of Moscow, that it was much like North Carolina. I can't remember all the trees that are identified, but you had maples and sycamores, uh, bald cypress, uh, a very thick vegetation, lots of trees. Um, uh, but uh, the desert picture here shows us something that we can't see very well by looking at the present day Moscow Mountain. The top of the mountain range here is a place called Mount Len, Lemon. And it's about not, a little over 9,000 feet. Where we're standing, taking the photograph, we are 6,000 feet below that peak, about 10 miles away. And uh, I like to make a comparison between here and what it was like before the basalt flow was coming in. If I was standing 10 miles away in Pullman, maybe I would be a rhinoceros or a camel or something in the mind. But they were standing there looking up at uh, Moscow Mountain. This is what they would have seen in terms of 
its height, its sudden elevations. There was a very rapid change in elevations from the basement floor to the top. The basement rocks here of granite and with granite in Moscow, at the time of the basalts came in, the Moscow area, Moscow Mountain is made up of granite. Uh, very steep faces, uh, drilling uh, drill holes tell us that the con contact between the aquifer system and the granites is very steep. Now what you have to imagine, sort of our fantasy here, is that uh, that rhinoceros, if he didn't uh, hear the basalt flows coming, he starts to be overwhelmed with the first flow and most flows were about 100 feet thick. And within 300,000 years, the salts and sediments would have filled up to about the halfway point to our present situation. If you were standing in Poland and looking at Moscow Mountain in a vision, what you would see is just the top part of this mountain range. So we fill up a basin very quickly and it's thick. It's unique in the fact that you have the salts and sediments jamming up against such deep mountains. When you go around the Columbia River Basin, there is a, it's rare to find a situation like that, to where it's a sudden increase in elevation and leaves us with a mountain range of about 3,000 feet above our present day basalt floor in, in, in Moscow. Uh, what I want to say is the reason you had such a big canyon in there was that the Paleo-Palouse River flowed from the city of Palouse, from Potlatch to the city of Palouse and down into Pullman. And it was a steep canyon, a very, uh, probably a steep canyon like the Clearwater Drain, something like that. So not only if you want to fantasize sitting out here before the first basalt flow river was you, uh, you were sitting alongside a major stream drainage, which later in our present day, we'll come back and talk about its importance down the road. A little bit about the general, general setting. Um, the salt side of what we call a Pasco Basin out in the central part of the flow of the area are over 13,000 feet in thickness. And most of those made up by the Grand Ronde flows. Uh, the Grand Ronde is almost 10,000 feet thick out there. In Moscow, in the Moscow area, the basalts, as we pointed out, are about 3,000 feet thick. In the 19, late 1960s, we were, the belief was that there were lots of buried volcanoes buried in the beneath the basalts and sediments, that we hadn't yet identified where the volcano centers were. It was visualized as being like Hawaii, lots of big peaks, because it was believed the basalt flow could only go about 30 miles. And, and it turns out that it's within five years of that time, by the time we get into the 70s, there was sort of uh, a revolution in terms of thinking, lots of money spent on the Columbia River Plateau, hundreds of people out mapping, primarily because there was money available to do that kind of work. And the things that were unraveled was most of the Grand Rhombosols came out of a dike swarm down here uh, in uh, the Grand Ronde area. Uh, uh, an older professor had given presentations, uh, Tabernick was his name, Tabernock was his name, and he had believed that these dikes down here were hundreds of dikes down here, and they were the source of uh, the flows, not like out of a big volcano, but out of linear dikes. They, were, they could be projected in and including one right by our Moscow Poland Basin in the subsurface. So the flows came out of the Grand Ronde area. Um, some of the flows sort of went up the drainage into the Lewiston embayment, filling in stream channels. Uh, but most of the flows 
we're heading towards the Pasco Basin because what was happening out in the Pasco Basin, it wasn't a giant hole, but it was sinking fast. It sinks over 13,000 feet in 300,000 years, very rapid subsidence. So the low area out in the Pasco Basin was controlling where the flows went. Now, when it, was, it overspilled, some of the flows went right by the Moscow Pullman Basin and headed all the way up to Spokane. In the Pasco area, well, throughout the whole plateau, they've identified over 350 basalt flows. Some of these flows covered long distances. We've talked before, I think, mentioned that the low, low flow there, we just looked at on our photograph. That same flow can be traced all the way to the ocean, over to Yakima, up to Wenatchee up can so the flows went a long distance it wasn't uh, early on in the research it didn't most people didn't believe they could go that far but they've been literally traced outcrop to outcrop uh, by, and by geochemistry through wells in the moscow area some of the flows went by didn't go in because the interesting part is while the pasco basin was going down the moscow Poland basin was stable it's underlined by basement rock and stratigraphic correlations now verify that once you get into the pool and start driving towards Moscow, the ground has been stable roughly for 16 million years. Uh, so it stayed still while the Pasco Basin was going down, but every now and then, 25 times that we know of, the salt would overspill and spill into the Moscow Poland Basin. Let's see what that might look like here. So this is just taking one instant replay of the way the flows moved uh, during the site extrusion of one flow. So they're coming out of the south. Well, curse we're going here. They're coming out of the south and they're bending to the west to get out the Pasco Basin, but 25 times, 20 to 25 times, I should correct that. We don't know exactly the number, so let's just say 20. 20 times major flows came into the Moscow Pullman Basin throughout that 300,000 years. Now I'm gonna take something here and relate, why do we talk about origin? Well, it helps to explain groundwater situations later on. This is just one of the examples. Let's take my cursor here and go higher arrow to arrow around so you see sort of got a fan like pattern that fan like pattern turns out to be very important in understanding uh, our water system and i'll come back and explain that the flows when they went across pullman kind of fanned out they're settled over a stable area they slowed maybe a little colder than others developed uh, good intraflow zones Whereas to the west of Pullman, there was still a lot of things happening, a lot of flows bouncing against the basement rocks, uh, being cross-cut by major dikes, and trying to, in some cases, mixing with other flows, and they're trying to get out to the Pasco area. The Pullman, Moscow Pullman area were like the, you can think of them as being fan-shaped layers, one across Pullman, averaging about 100 feet thick, and then thinning out before we get to Moscow. Let me look at, give me a second here to check my slides. Oh yeah, I love basalt stratigraphy, but we're gonna have to, you're gonna have to accept the fact that you may not. And, but we're gonna try to boil down the names. Remember, for 350 some flows of basalt flows that have been identified and traced, not all, more widespread. Some are just local. Of all those names, there's a name for each one of those flows. They've been grouped into members in some cases. And in the Moscow Poland area, again, like I mentioned, there's about 25 flows. About 20 of those were widespread. Uh, and we have the sediments. All those have a name. And so we're going to see if we can look at this chart and simplify that into a few names so we don't get confused as we proceed. The lake, the sediments. The sediments belong to the Lake Tall Formation. 
if you are interested, they're equivalent to the Ellensburg Formation over to the west of, uh, way over west of Vantage in the Ellensburg area. The names we use for the lower oldest most sediments are the sediments of Moscow, the Vantage member, and the sediments of Bolville. So we'll try to keep the names just down to those three sediment layers. The sediments of Moscow are equivalent to the uh, Grand Ron flows. They're shown here in green, they're listed here in green. The Vantage member is laterally equivalent to both the Wampum flows shown in blue and to some of the Grand Ron flows uh, shown in green. The sediments of Bowlville are considered to be laterally equivalent to basalts we call the Saddle Mountains basalt. We're not going to worry about these other names because they're just local flows. And for the most part, they'll show up today a little bit on uh, in my lecture, but for the most part, they don't play a part, important part in the hydrology. We will refer to the low, low flows many times, particularly since what we call the Saloto, low, low covers our whole area. Give me a chance to wet my lips here. And since it belongs to the Wampum Formation, there'll be references to one from basalt. One flow, just a little bit older than the Priest Rapids flow or the low low flows, is called the Rosa member. We will be talking about the Rosa flow today. And it does play an important part in the hydrology of the area. So we'll be talking about the basalt of low low and the uh, Rosa flow, which belong to the one from basalt. In, in general, our contact between the uh, Grand Ron and the Wampum is the change between our aquifer system where it's separated particularly by the Vantage member. Now we get over the Grand Ron. Man, a lot of names for them. Uh, it gets pretty hard to keep track. So we're not gonna bother with these names, these individual members and flows. We're gonna talk about what we call uh, mag stratigraphic magnetic units and we're going to just look we're going to try to work with just this column where we use these terms r1 n1 r2 n2 in the early days of mapping the grand ron grand ron is a thick sequence i mean 10,000 feet in the pasco area in the wells outcrop after outcrop examined over uh over the entire plateau most of them all look alike sort of fine grain dense trying to correlate them from location to location up until the late 60s, early 70s was almost impossible. In the Moscow area, we, there was a lot of debate whether the flows in the subsurface of the Moscow even could be correlated over to Pullman. So uh, it was the most geologists kind of threw up their hands and the same for the hydraulics, had no idea that the flows went so so far and could be correlated so far. So early on, before we started giving names to individual flows, uh, USGS workers from major, going up sequences all over the basin, hundreds of them, they used a, what was called a paleomagnetometer to measure in the rock what the paleomagnetic direction was for that rock. In other words, when a lava flow cools and crystallizes, it freezes the magnetic declination of that time. Well, it turns out they found there were four wide units that referred to as R1. Uh, they put R1 in terms in front of the, the earlier flows, which were reversed. They put N for the flows that were normal polarity, meaning it matched up with the present day magnetic fields. And then they had another reversal that they identified. And then they had going back to normal and they called these R1, N1, R2, and N2. We will today talk a little bit about the R1 and the N1. Most of our time, most of our lectures, just gonna focus on this R2 area and we don't need to know the names of the individual members. We'll refer to it as the R2 and a little bit about the N2 overline. So that allows us to, 
to make it a little much simpler to understand everything. If you are interested in the detailed stratigraphy and evolution of the color basalts in the Moscow area, there's a paper on Miocene evolution, both on PBAC's webpage and on the Idaho Geological Survey's publication list uh, and on their webpage uh, by myself and others, I uh, believe 2019. It's a long volume, but if you're interested in how of chemistry, the stratigraphic correlations, the terms we use, I refer you to that. For us, we're going to stick to three cams for the sediments that belong to the late tall formation. We're going to stick to the basalt of Lolo, which belongs to the wampum, the Rosa member, which belongs to the wampum, and then four reversal units to the Grand Ron. And remember, in the Pullman area, we well that shows us that the, the Grand Ron basalts, which are the most important to us in terms of hydrology, the Grand Ron basalts. Uh, total about 2,000 feet in thickness, and all four magnetic units are represented. So let's take a little look at a more detailed cross-section. We have looked at the, uh, at the uh, more generalized ones. There's actually a very detailed one uh, available online, uh, both at the PBAC and Idaho Geological Survey. This is a, some, this is a uh, generalization of the detailed work that we did, and then the one we'll look at most of the time is a generalization of this one. It's still good to look at it once in a while. The yellow is the sediment, sediment zones, mostly here on the eastern side uh, of the Moscow Pullman Basin. The blue up here at the top, that's our low, low flow going across. That's one where all of our outcrops are. Uh, the greens and the reds, that's the, the reds are the R2. We're going to focus on those. There are several flows, several members. The one thing you might be remember is all these details on this flow, but remember a couple things. One, these flows thin and pinch out as they head towards Moscow. So that diagram I showed you where the flows are fanning into the Moscow Pullman Basin, that might be this one flow here where I got the cursor now. One flow standing in and pinching out. They just didn't stop. They didn't make a 100-foot wall and make a dam that created a huge lake. In this case, they slowly pinched out, thinned from maybe 100 feet down to maybe 30 feet and eventually end. This is the ones we'll be talking about the most. The deep well at WSU 7 shows that there's a huge thickness of older rocks. The purple down here, these are the R1. These are the oldest. The blues are the, belong to the N1. And this area does have some water, and the upper part of it is interconnected to our aquifer system. But the research from that well shows that those zones are not that prolific. So uh, all of our water in Pullman, well, most of our water in Pullman, comes from the R2 zone with the most prolific zone between the contact of the R2 and N1. So we're just going to talk about the origin a little bit of these, of these uh, uh, flows. And what we're going to do, we're going to present a, what we mean by paleo uh, reconstructions, paleo geographic reconstructions. And then we will uh, run through a sequence starting from the oldest up through the top. And like I said, these flows came out in less than uh, 300,000 years. Um, 20 some flows. So you can figure out yourself for the average time, the average uh, event. Uh, if there's, if there's 25 to 30 flows you have an event. Uh, about every 30,000 years. In the Columbia River Basin itself, by the way, with that 10,000 feet of Grand Ronde basalts over in El Pasco, just for the Grand Ronde alone, there was a volcanic event somewhere out on the plateau 
every 1,000 years on the average. They're not evenly spurfed once every 1,000 years, but on the average. So rapid, fascinating story of, of the uh, how fast the area filled up and the origin of those basalt flows. Let's look down to our generalized diagram. Keep ourselves straight here. Uh, we're going to talk about the origin, the in placement of the basalts into our area and how that created our three segments of A, B, and C. So after we look at one paleogeographic construction, that's going to be right up here between the uh, uh, top of the Grand Ronde and the base of the low, low flow, just to show you what kind of knowledge we can come up with on one particular instant replay. So let's look at this. This is a paleo uh, geographic setting of the area at the end of the Grand Run. So the Grand Run flows are already underneath. What's amazing about the Columbia River results is that you can correlate flows over a long distance and the flows are basically a timeline. So I can look at my data and uh, identify where I have the rosa, either exposed to the subsurface or at the surface. And I can find out that here's the end of it. This blue line just didn't quite get a base of much. What did it do? It blocked all the drainages as many of the other flows do. And was at this time, had re by this time, had reversed the drainages to go through the Butte Gap up towards Palouse. Uh, so uh, time-wise, this is the longest time where the Moscow area was exposed to the surface without another volcanic flow coming in. The Rosa flow didn't make it. It blocked the drainages. Uh, now here's the part that comes down to the, so why is it, well, what must, excuse me for a moment, but why is that so important? It's just an, origin, the flow came that far. Now take your eyes and follow this cursor along the edge of the flow. Well, the basalts are thin along there, and you got about over 10 miles of thin flows that are interfingered with the sediments. And guess where one of our recharge areas turns out to be? One of our recharge areas is along that flow. The important part for looking ahead and we'll point this out many times, is that if you count all the edges, all these edges in a subsurface that we have throughout uh, the Moscow Pullman area, uh, you have close to uh, 200 miles of areas to where the basalt flows are thinning and pinching out into the sediments. And that becomes crucial to understanding the hydrology. And the other reason it's so important, if you can create a paleogeographic construction like this, you can go from the cross section and project into the area. So in other words, if on the cross section, if on the cross section you want to calculate for your numerical model or your uh, general model, you want to calculate how thick this R2 is, where most of our water is coming from. So what's its volume? Well, the way you do that from the cross section is, is you come to one of these places, uh, let's say this contact here, and then you look at, project out into the north using paleogeographic reconstructions, and you can see how far that flow goes, how far these units go, and calculate the volume. You difficult to calculate the volume from here, because it's just a slice. And we don't have enough data to draw hundreds of slices through the Palouse Basin. So the way you project and get an idea how far these flows go is how, what your volume is, is to project from the cross sections by using paleogeographic constructions. Now give me a second here. What we want to do next, just to give you a sense for how the, the uh, salts enter the area and how they influence the subsurface. We're going to start down here at the bottom. 
back to this cross section. We're going to start down here at the bottom, and we're going to come up through time. We're going to do 300,000 years of time all the way to the top of the low low, and then maybe even a little bit on to the present to give you a sense of what the settings were. You don't need to keep track of the details, just sort of keep track of the pattern. We're going to do it in lumps. We're going to start off here right at the end of the R1. We'll do a couple geographic settings for uh, the N1. We'll do a couple for the R1, one for the N1, and the one up. Uh, remember, these are just like instant replays through the 300,000 years. Uh, what's neat about the basalts, and what I probably didn't mention, there is, pro to my knowledge, no volcanic area, stratigraphic uh, sediment area in the world to where you can divide from the knowledge we have, that you can divide it up in the instant replays. We could slice instant replays flow by flow 350 times for the Columbia River Basin, at least 25 times for the Moscow Pullman area. Now, some of this is done in publications. You can find some of those on the publications, publications throughout on the Columbia River Plateau. Pardon me for mumbling again. Uh, the point is, there's no place in the world like this. This has always fascinated me. Other people to get bored by it, but it's important to know. You don't need to follow it all up in detail. It's important to know that we can do this. You can take a slice laterally through across the Columbia River Plateau into Moscow, and look, this is what it was like then. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to flash through the sequence, starting with what we call the end of the R1 flows. Remember, we started off with this deep canyon of the Paleo-Palouse River flowing from uh, Palouse down in towards Pullman. So we're going to fill that canyon with the R1 flows. And man, we're almost through half of the basalts already. The Grand Ronde R1 flows in the WSU well and around 900 feet thick. So we're going to, this is instant replay here, is what happens after we place 900 feet? Well, the main canyon is going to be filled. How do I know that it went this far? I can take the elevation of the um, top of the R1 flows out of the WSU well, take that elevation, this basin has been stable, and project out elevation-wise how far it could have been going. They're obviously interpretive line, but it gives you a pretty good idea. If you wanted to calculate the volume of the R1 flows, uh, this is how you would calculate it from our cross section. We only have one data point down here in Pullman, but the paleo reconstruction allows us to extrapolate it out to this far. Now, the other big thing that we can notice off of this diagram, this is going to happen again and again. The flows come into Pullman and they block up the drainages against our basement rocks. So you get sedimentation off the basement rocks. You get stream action along the edges of each one of these flows. Stream action means uh, you're going to have some channel sediments, so uh, sand or gravel. We do know that most of, it, most of the sediments come off the mountains because it was wet. And a lot of the mountain areas were as the rock granites weathered pretty fast in a wet climate, a lot of material coming down was clay, but there was also 30% of it was sand deposited in stream channels and always going to be along the easternmost fronts against the basin rocks. Probably some along against Kamiak Butte and Smoot Hill. We just don't have enough wells to know for sure. Uh, it's a little bit of speculation here on my behalf to say what happened to the Palouse River. Well, here I have it coming across, going through a place called the Four Mile. That's speculation. It's not speculation on the area was plugged by a thousand feet of this hole. Probably uh, in less than uh, 100,000 years. Let's go through time and get me again. I got to settle up here. Now I'm going to try to go a little faster through the emplacement events. Here's the early N1 flows. Not all the flows went the same distance. They pinched out at a different time. But again, sediments over here towards along the mountain fronts. 
We're going to jump up in time again and go to the late N1 flows. This is one that's interesting because we identified at that time interval, there were large stream deposits of gravels, uh, clays, uh, sands, uh, intermixed with pillow lavas. So there was some kind of major stream beneath Pullman, which is the point, by the way, that is the number one prolific water producing zone in Pullman. Now we're looking back in time, it was produced well, somewhere back there 16 million years ago because the late uh, uh, N1 flow had retreated a bit from the earliest, at least along this side, along this western side. And the, the river, which we think was the ancestral Palouse River, flowed through there and then back out of the system. Speculation to whether where it went up here, that's why all the question marks. But this we do know. This is the extent of the N1 flows. We keep on jumping uh, up in time. Let's jump up here to the uh, R1, R2 flows. The bottom part are the R2 flows. Now, this is where we start to get a lot of our water gets into this system. One more time, though, we have the sediments over on this side, and we have a basalt flow coming in and filling up uh, much of the basin. Whoops, I just messed up here. Hang on a second. I tend to do that. Ah, what happened at the end of the R1? This is when all the R1 flows, the R1 flows, I mean, excuse me, the R2 flows tend to be about 400 to 600 feet uh, in thickness. They pretty much pushed into the whole area, went up into the Palouse area. At that time, we can also identify that some bending of the rock starts to occur here in the Pullman area, primarily because to the west, way out to Palouse, the Pasco Basin is sinking at a pretty rapid rate. And locally, right up against the basement rocks, we have sinking of the basalts out here in the Union Flat Creek area. Even though they're a little small here, guess what? You're gonna get sediments along the mountain front. The uh, R2 flows move back and forth. And if we look at the cross section, we see lots of thinning out flows. Some of them got close to the mountain fronts. We jump up in time. This is an interesting picture. We get to the last Grand Ron flow. And there we have a lot of data because we have a lot of domestic wells coming through the upper aquifer down into the Grand Ronde or the lower aquifer. And that particular pattern there is more accurate than others because we have a lot of domestic wells that now get down into the uh, lower aquifer system out in the central part of our plateau. And we've looked at tens of those, hundreds of those over the entire Palouse Basin. So this boundary is pretty accurate, identified by correlations from well to well. Uh, as far as we can tell, there was very little or no streams, very few little streams heading across the Pullman. Some maybe going out to the west. We can identify from the sediments that the streams along this, these edges of this edge of this particular flow were braided streams and they flowed northward at that time to Slough City. The present day upper aqua supplies are primarily from those stream channels. Moscow, as I probably mentioned, has the only municipal uh, supplies available. Uh, uh, it's been off and on pumped for nearly 100 years. The resources for those municipal supplies are available from ancient change sand channels produced by the lava flows pushing in towards the mountain fronts, and you get the same pattern. The salt's coming in, and again, they didn't enter in a, end in a 100-foot wall. They thinned out. And then we got the intermixing between those contacts and the sevens. That contact there, if we trace the distance, it's probably about 12 miles of fronts between the cements and the basalts. We continue on just to finish our story here. Uh, continue on to where the low, low flow comes in, the one you're the most familiar with. The low, low flow is one of those uh, extensive flows. And as far as the Moscow pulmonary, it was the most extensive. 
get pushed up against the mountain fronts over here in Albion. You can see it's uh, arid Albion and, and on the south end of the Smooth Hill, the north end of the Smooth Hill. You can see gout crops where it's sitting right smack against vertical dipping quartzites. Interesting. Uh, whether it pushed up against the Kemiak Butte, uh, not sure I have enough data. I have some data along there that says it's set against the rocks. Uh, we had one sort of, I wouldn't say a failed project, uh, but we had one project trying to find out about the sands along the uh, Kamii Butte. Uh, we only ended up being able to dig uh, one ditch to see. That ditch was all mud, but it was sediment, or showed that there was mud between the, the uh, mud, meaning, I get sidetracked, mud the same as clay. Clay is just lithified mud. Uh, we showed that there was very little very few sands along there, but some sediments. But the low, low flow is the one that's crucial to keep our thinking about. It's the one that uh, our thinking can start with and think downward. Uh, during the low, low, shortly after, there was some continued upwarming because it now forms an anticline. It's the top of an anticline west of Pullman. So there was some volcanic or tectonic activity. Moscow Pullman Basin remained stable. Now that was the end of the massive flows. Most of it was Grand Ron, uh, 16 million years ago. The low, low flow is dated shortly afterwards, uh, around 16 million years ago. We just went through 300,000 years of volcanic history, and we have filled up the Moscow Pullman Basin uh, with 2,700 to 3,000 feet of salts and sediments. So everything has changed. The volcanism slowed down and things set pretty still until uh, uh, later. Right after the volcanism slowed down, what happened? Well, you finally, the streams and everything's trying to get reestablished. You finally have some peaceful times. For, for the next four million years, there were sediments deposited out across from the mountains, covered Pullman, covered Palouse, may have covered Colfax. Sediments being deposited from the mountain fronts, the streams started to try to get reestablished to this massive input of basalts and sediments. They still are not totally adjusted to that sudden emplacement of such thick basalt flows. 12 million years ago, come on, oh, I got to move down again. Remember, I have to move down. I kind of slow up here. Okay. Uh, 12 million years ago, there were some local flows. These are what I refer to as, are referred to as the Saddle Mountains flows. <coughs> the brown shows their extent. Uh, the sediments of Bol Bolville were still being deposited or reworked, actually being eroded and deposited. Uh, these things did disrupt the drainage again, but now we've got to jump all the way from this 12 million year old event all the way up to the present time. There's no volcanic events that we have identified in the Moscow Pullman or the Palouse Basin uh, area that occurred after the 12 million year mark. So we get to, we got to go from 12 million to the present time. So we've got 12 million years of erosion. So in most places around the world, that would mean big, steep, thick canyons. But the system was so overwhelmed with a rise in the water base level that erosion was pretty slow. But eventually we get to our present day. And what we see, the white should be colored blue. That's okay. Okay. The white is the area which you probably now understand is all underlain by the basalt of Lolo. This illustration again is without, uh, with, it's stripped off the Lutz. The sediments of Bowlville have eroded back to where we still have pretty thick sequences along the mountain fronts. Some stream channels, stream patterns are starting to, to uh, form. Uh, here we have in the down near Moscow, we have three major drainages, along with the four mile drainage to the north, going across the central part of our area <coughs> in east-west fashion. Uh, 
and trying to form a dendritic system. As we've pointed out before, they get over to Pullman and they suddenly go to the Northwest. The, the sevens of Bullville have been stripped down. What the outcrops that you see are where the stream has also cut through the lusts and is exposing little outcrops along the drainages. The other outcrops you see are oftentimes road cuts and quarries. So this is the present day setting. And let's take a little look and relate it now. During this rapid uh, story about uh, the emplacement of the basalts over 300,000 years, uh, you should be able to relate that back to the cross section and what we mean by segments A, B, and C. Remember, we had paleogeographic settings that were depositing sediments here on the Idaho side. This line again is approximately the Washington State boundary. And what you should have seen from the illustrations is a continual repeat of the same setting with flows pinching out. Here's our Grand Ron flows on this generalized uh, drawing, pinching out into the sediments. Uh, where the sediment or the basalts dominate and the pinch outs end, except for maybe this N2, we stopped and looked at that setting, the N2, right here's where it ends on this diagram, again, about the Washington State boundary. But when you get into the central part of the area along the highway from Moscow to Pullman, underlying is all these other flows stacked on top of each other. As far, we only have one deep well out there, but the sediments certainly have thinned. We have one well, it's 900 feet deep, and uh, detailed geology done on that well drilled back in 1972. Uh, the sediments have thinned out, and there's one stack of horizontal salt flows one after another. The vantage is even thin up here in our upper aquifer. The low low maintains its thickness, but that well, that 900 foot well shows us that we can extrapolate uh, that there's a thick sequence of basalts, very little sediments. And if we project this to, norm, to the north towards the Butte Gap area, that area is underlined by what we call segment B. Just this cross section. You have to think north. So what setting did we have? This is where all the fan-shaped flows came in before they started to thin. So in the stable area, that's why they're relatively horizontal. We get out here to the west now to segment C, and of course things are a little bit different because <coughs> somewhere in the system, we believe in the R2 interval, we started to have some folding, some bending. We now have the Pullman Anticline, which is west of Pullman. Uh, Grant Street uh, is in what we call a downfold or a syncline. It's located in the low part of a, of a fold. This area is gently folded, not big folds. And then we know that these rocks dip to the west to accommodate the down dropping the down folding out here on the Union Flat Creek. So we have a segment A in sediments, segment B in horizontal flows, mostly basalt dominated, and in uh, segment C, which the basalts are slightly deformed and they slope to the west. So looking ahead, what this tells me and has suggested to me for a long time is that even though our water levels are connected in the lower aquifer over through this whole area, it tells me that the hydrological parameters for segment A is different than it is for segment B and is different in the segment C. And that's the part where we're heading. We're going to, next time we're talking about the basics of Columbia River basalt hydrology, uh, information summarized from all over the Columbia River Plateau and brought into our area and show the various parts that may allow us to explain how our water moves from location to location uh, across our Palouse Basin system. So thanks for your time, and we'll see you next time on the basics of the Columbia River Basalt Hydrology. Well, thanks, Steve.